I want to speak to you concerning the invincible life, the unconquerable life of the Lord Jesus Christ. This could, you could take this and say, oh, it's one of those messages about Christ, one of those things about the resurrection. Let me ask you to, in silent prayer, just ask God, thy, his Holy Spirit, to speak to your own heart and apply this message today. All right, looking at the invincible life of Jesus, 1 Peter 1.21 says, Who by him do believe in God, speaking of God the Father, in Christ, you believe in God the Father, that raised him, that raised Christ, up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Uh, the idea of the resurrection reinforcing your faith and and hope in God. So let me just mention a few things that the resurrection brings our attention to this. That God raised Christ from the dead. He raised him from the dead. We need to recognize that Jesus himself testified that God raised him from the dead. When John the Apostle was uh, taken in spirit up into heaven, and shown from there, that viewpoint, things yet future, Christ himself met him in Revelation chapter 1, verse 18. And Christ said to him, I am he that liveth and was dead. <laughs> uh, that's a personal testimony. I'm here talking to you, and you know, because John was there when he died, I was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. Or that's the truth. And have the keys of hell and of death. The word hell here is Hades, that uh, place that people today go if they're, if they're not saved. It is, uh, Christ called it at one point, a furnace of fire. Yet to come is what I call hell, the Gehenna, the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone. So, uh, several things to point out here. First is that Jesus was really dead. There's some people that are thinking that maybe a resurrection from the dead is, is too hard even for God, so they want to make it easy and say he didn't really die. He just appeared to die, and then he appeared to come back from the dead when he just revived. Uh, the idea that uh, in the cool uh, of, the, uh, of the tomb... Uh, he revived and uh, got out of there, and uh, people saw him alive and figured he'd come back from the dead. The thing is, he was wrapped in a cloth like a mummy, and then literally a hundred pounds of ointment was poured onto him that soaked into that. It, it would gel and, and harden um, to uh, preserve the body. Um, Really hard to uh, wake up in that and just shuffle it off and get out there. He was really dead. The hardened soldiers and the weeping women at the cross, they saw him die. The governor inquired after the fact of his death. Uh, in other words, this was an official inquiry. How is he dead so quickly? They don't usually die this fast. And he had spoken to him and he knew he was he, he was a carpenter man, and he walked all over the, the country. He was a man of strong health. So and he uh, called in the, the guy that was in charge. He said, yes, he's dead. The Jewish rulers feared a conspiracy of resurrection rumor, but they had no doubt that he was dead. They had made sure of that. So they did not craft a lie about his death, they crafted a lie about his empty tomb. We know the body was not in the tomb because the enemies could have easily put a stop to Christianity by showing the body. Why didn't they? Because it wasn't there. So Jesus was really dead, but secondly, Jesus was really alive. 
there were many eyewitnesses. These, uh, as you're going to see, was not just a couple of, you know, loco uh, followers of Jesus saying, I think I saw him, I think I saw him. The scriptures relate 13 appearances of Christ alive after his death. I won't have time to look them up, uh, take a long time, 13 different ones. But Mary Magdalene, perhaps first, John 20. The women returning to the city, Matthew 28. Peter, by himself, Luke 24. Two disciples on the road to Emmaus, Luke 24. The ten disciples, uh, there were, uh, the, Judas had killed himself by this time, there was only 11, and uh, Thomas was missing. So ten in John 20. The 11, a week later, Thomas being present in John 20, a little bit later. Seven disciples in Galilee were gathered. Then over 500 at one time. Christ had actually scheduled this meeting. He had scheduled the place where it was to happen, a mountain in Galilee. And um, he reminded them, and the angels reminded them at the, uh, at the empty tomb when Christ appeared outside and the angels inside. They said, uh, remember that he will meet you in Galilee. That was the scheduled time. So all these others were, were just, uh, not chance, but uh, were just individual meetings, surprise meetings. This was the scheduled meeting. And so over 500 people gathered. And that's in 1 Corinthians 15. James, uh, his brother, in 1 Corinthians 15, 7, at the ascension, there on the Mount of uh, Olives, he arose up from heaven. And Mark 16, Luke 24, and Acts 1 talks about that. Three more appearances happened after his ascension to heaven. This was actual appearances, but um, miraculous in the sense that they saw, uh, were given a vision of what was happening in heaven. Stephen, as he was being killed in Acts 7, saw him standing at the right hand of the Father. Paul, on the road to Damascus, uh, saw him, heard him speak. He introduced himself as Jesus in the book of Acts 9, 26, and 1 Corinthians 15, 8. And finally, John on the Isle of Patmos was taken up, and as we mentioned in the text, he saw him, talked to him, Christ introduced himself. Now, these, you try to explain these away, but they, these were not glimpses in the dark, I think I saw him, or imagined sightings in a crowd. Jesus spent 40 days visiting with the disciples and instructing them in their future duties. In Acts 1-3, the uh, historian Luke, who had checked with all the eyewitnesses, said, To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion, after his suffering, by many infallible proofs. A historian saying he showed unmistakable, infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Now, with all of that, it doesn't mean that there was no doubt. In fact, there were many doubts. The disciples greeted Christ's first resurrection visits with skepticism because they knew he had died. They had seen the death. They had seen the body being taken care of. They watched when he was buried in the tomb. Contrary to naive um, liberal theologians, they were not predisposed to believe in a resurrection of a beaten and crucified person. Crucifixion was guaranteeing they were dead and that in much pain. They were not gullible, but they themselves were hard to convince. Listen to Luke 24, 11 and 38. Christ is speaking to them. Um, and the women's words, uh, this is when the women who the angel had talked to came back and told the disciples. And the women's words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. The disciples who heard him say he was going to be raised the third day didn't believe that it happened. And then in verse 38, Christ is saying to the two on the road to Emmaus, he said to them, why are you troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Uh, they should have believed. They should have understood. 
In John 20, 25 and 27, other disciples therefore said unto Thomas, unto him, we have seen the Lord. But he said, sure you did. I saw him dead. Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into the side where that sword, that spear was put up through the ribs and into the heart cavity, releasing the, the fluid around the pericardium that came out as water. Uh, he says, unless I put my fingers in the holes, you see, I will not believe. And then Christ showed up and Thomas was there. And all those made up doubts just went away. And Christ said, I heard what you said. Verse 27, he said to Thomas, reach hither thy finger, behold my hand, reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. By the way, Thomas knew how foolish he had been in his unbelief. His answer was, my Lord and my God, <laughs> my master and my God. At first they thought he was a ghost or some psychic echo of their former friend. Jesus recognized the, this, demolished the idea. <laughs> John remembers they touched the risen Lord. John, 1 John 1.1, 1, 1. that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. John's special phrase for Christ. Jesus commanded doubting Thomas to touch his wounds in his resurrected body. Jesus insisted on eating to demonstrate that he was not a ghost. Take a bite and it falls down on the floor, you know. Luke 24. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I, myself, handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. While they yet believed not for joy, <laughs> still not believing, and wondered, right, staring him in the face. He said unto them, have you here any meat? The word for food. They gave him a piece of broiled fish and of a honeycomb, and he took it and did eat before them. Ghosts are notorious for not eating because they don't have stomachs. So they doubted, but with this, they became absolutely convinced. Not a doubt. Nobody could reintroduce doubt to them. They had seen him. They had touched him. They watched him eat that Snickers bar. You know. Second Peter 1.16, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They saw it. His appearances filled the disciples with boldness. The fear that they felt they've killed the master, they're going to come after us next, disappeared when the slain master arrived and said, I'm okay. I'm better than okay. Death itself was in God's power. They risked their lives to announce the fact of the resurrection. At 50 days after Passover was the Feast of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit came. Peter stood up, doubting Peter, you know, betraying Peter. He stood up and said to that crowd, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he could be holden of it. Death is not possible death could hold him. And then verse 32, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. He's talking to the people that were saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Was he afraid? No. God had power over life and death. Acts 3.15 and killed the prince or the author of life. 
Do you catch the ir irony of that? They killed the one who gave humanity life. And whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. We saw it. We saw him. A third thought is this, that Jesus' resurrection was different from all before. There had been resurrections recorded in the Old Testament and so on. 1 Corinthians 15, 20, But now is Christ <clears throat> risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. First fruits was the sacrifice given to God when the first uh, plants grew up in the field. Uh, this was not the first harvest or anything. It was just the first plants. They would come by and cut those off and gather them and give them back to God, saying, thank you for this indication of what will come. We will get the full harvest because these have already begun. Why is Christ called first fruits? His resurrection body was more than a resuscitated mortal body. All of the bodies that had been raised from the dead, Christ raised three people from the dead, a little girl that had just died, a man who had died and was on the carrier, the, the bier, uh, being carried to the tomb, and Lazarus, who had been in the tomb for three days. He raised them all from the dead, but he raised them back to their mortal bodies, and so they would have died later but not Christ. It was the same and yet not the same. It was better. It was improved. It was uh, human body 2.0, you know, it was the revised version. Our bodies as believers will be like his when we are changed or resurrected at the rapture of the church. Listen to Philippians 3.21. Who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. The God who can do all things, the God who can bring all things uh, into a fitting pattern for himself, will take our vile bodies. The older I get, the more vile I recognize that things are. Hard to get over and so on. will be changed to his glorious body where nothing can infect it, nothing can affect it. Uh, we are, have spiritual control over it. Paul, you remember, perhaps pictured a buried body to be like a seed sown in the earth. You plant a seed, you plant a dead body in the ground, you see, with the implied promise of growth to come. Compare how the buried body is sown in the earth and how it changes when raised to life. Here's the passage to meditate on, 1 Corinthians 15, 42 to 44. In 1 Corinthians 15, the apostle is chastising the Corinthians who had begun to adopt a philosophy that, well, we don't believe in resurrection. He says, if you're a Christian, you believe in resurrection. So also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown, it is put into the ground, um, uh, in corruption, beginning to decay. It is raised in incorruption, incapable of decay. It is sown in dishonor. The body gave up, dishonor. It is raised in glory, never to be defeated in death. It is sown in weakness, some illness, some car, some bullet, something overcame its power. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body, born of natural birth. It is raised a spiritual body, having been born again. There is a natural body, there is a spiritual body. As the natural body is subject to natural conditions, a spiritual body seems to be subject only to the spirit, and therefore what you want to do, what, where you want to be, you can do that. My fourth point is this, that God exerted tremendous divine power. Uh, we don't really know what God technically had to do, 
to raise Christ from the dead, to bring that physical body into a spiritual domain to where it looks like a human body, but now is immune from death. What all did he have to do? But it took great power. We should know that Jesus controlled his life and death. In John 10, 17 and 18, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. This is what he understood. He says, No man taketh it from me. Whatever it looks like, I'm laying it down. They're not taking it from me. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again. When he said, uh, Father, I give you my spirit. See? That was him letting it go. See? This commandment have I received of my father. He had received that promise before he came. During his life, uh, Herod's desire to kill him, he, he just mocked it. Herod wanted to kill him. And so Christ says, Luke 13, 32, he said unto them, go ye and tell that fox, he's so clever, you see, behold, I cast out devils and I do cures today and tomorrow and the third day I shall be perfected. He says he's not in control. He's not the one that says when my life ends. I do. He predicted the very details of his death and resurrection. Matthew 17, 22 and 23. While they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. They thought he was talking about something symbolic here. But it made him sorry. But he knew. And he told it. Again, divine power caused this resurrection. Romans 1, 4, our text, and declared to be the Son of God with power. God's power overcoming everything that we consider natural and normal. Ephesians 1, 19 and 20. What is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead? What kind of power does God give to us when we get saved? The same power that he gave to Christ's body when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places brought him up from heaven, from earth to heaven to be seated beside him. And his body was different because he entered a never-ending human life. He kept that human body even to the scars, but it would never die. Romans 6, 9. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death hath no more dominion over him. Going to the doctor and hearing what might be wrong and getting checked up and all this stuff, there is that sentence of death being enforced over my head, see. Um, frankly and honestly, that's like threatening to give me a ticket to heaven. I'm not sure that it's very scary. Um, more like finally, retirement. <laughs> you know? Hebrews seven sixteen. Who is made a priest, he's talking about, not after the law of a carnal commandment, of a fleshly commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Endless life. The second main thought that I have for you is this. God proved Christ's promises by his resurrection. Christ made some promises. If he died and was stayed dead, 
those promises couldn't be kept. We understand this because of several reasons. One, death itself is due to sin. Where does the sickness and death and all this come from? Finally, it came because sin came and, and broke our life connection to God. Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so upon us death passed upon all men, for that or in whom all have sinned. In Adam, we have no power over sin. Sin has dominion over us. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. There are several forms of death. There is um, drug-addicted insanity. There is um, the uh, spiritual death when people stop believing in God, start, stop trusting in him, stop thinking that there is a God, uh, signing a spiritual suicide pact. And then there's the actual death, that uh, sin that brought in corruption, and the corruption took the form of illnesses, and it takes us all. So death itself is due to sin. Secondly, D Jesus defeated both death and everything that causes death, and the devil. Acts 2.24 Whom God hath raised up, Christ being raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. The God of creation could not be held by the corruption of what he had made. Hebrews 2.14 For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, we, the children, are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. He became flesh and blood, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. As he came in human flesh, he defeated sin, defeated death, and therefore the, the one who has the power of death, the devil, was defeated. He destroyed him. A third thing is that the resurrection of Christ promises our victorious life. This is Romans 4.25. Who was delivered for our offenses. He was put to death for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. Part of our salvation message of the gospel. Not just he died for us, but he rose again in power. Romans 6.4b. As Christ was raised up from the dead... By the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. I'll be dealing with that text tonight. He guaranteed our forgiveness. 1 Corinthians 15, 17. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, so you are yet in your sins. If we put this in the positive, Christ was raised, our faith is not in vain, and we are not in our sins. His resurrection then was the guarantee of our forgiveness. He also guaranteed our acceptance with God. To face God could be the scariest thought in your mind because he is absolutely holy and he knows absolutely everything you've ever said or done or thought to do. But we will find him as a father welcoming us home. Hebrews 7 25. Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost, or forevermore, that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth, to make intercession for them. The devil is trying to accuse us, the brethren, but Christ is there to intercede and say, no, it's all paid for. My fourth point to this is that the risen Christ will raise believers. Our bodies may die, fail here on earth, and our spirit, joining Christ, will come back with him at the rapture. Our spirits will come back with him at the rapture, and he will raise up our bodies, changing them into everlasting life bodies, and our spirits will enter those bodies. Those bodies will be clothed about us again, and we will uh, live eternity. 
clothed with an immortal body. John 6, 40. And this is the will of him that sent me, Christ said, that everyone which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Romans 8, 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken, make alive your mortal bodies by or because of his spirit that dwelleth in you. Believers today have the privilege of having the Holy Spirit live within us and that uh, helps in some way uh, to make alive are mortal. Our mortal means subject to death, mortality. <clears throat> the third thing is this. God's power of resurrection reflects glory to Christ. A couple of passages here. John 11, 25 and 26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Um, unending life is our promise. Believest thou this? He asks Mary and Martha. And he asks us today, do you believe that? Now when God hands Christ the title deed to the earth, there in Revelation 5, heaven erupts with praise. And notice the praise that goes to Christ as he takes the title deed. Revelation 5, 9, and then verse 12. And they sung a new song saying, Thou, Jesus, art worthy to take the book, the book is that title deed, and to open the seals thereof. Why? Why are you worthy? For thou wast slain. And hast redeemed us to God by thy, thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Verse 12, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Here he is alive taking the title deed. He was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. The one who is raised from the dead receives great praise and glory to his name. By way of conclusion, let me tell you a story. It's obvious that anyone can doubt any and every historical fact. There are active in the world today uh, flat worlders who don't believe that the world is a ball. And uh, there are those that believe that we never went to the moon. And they have the, their, their facts to back it up. You can just deny anything you want to deny. But God gave the resurrection of Christ with extraordinary evidence. When God applies to your heart the historical evidence, the reliability of the witnesses, the courage of their preaching, the futility of the opposition, the amazing effectiveness of the gospel through these years and around the world, the coherence of the Christian worldview, and the glorious character of Jesus Christ, when it's applied to your life, you will, you will be convinced. My wife and I met uh, Dr. Ian Paisley, the great um, uh, Irish uh, man, uh, Paisley is not just a pattern for men's ties, but uh, is a, an area in, uh, in Ireland. He was very well respected. He was a great big guy. Uh, he held his Bible like a football and strode across campus uh, with big strides. And when he preached, you didn't need a microphone. just had a voice that had been grown up... Uh, speaking across fields. And uh, he wrote uh, in one of his uh, books, one of his messages, 
this following record. The account of the conversion of two of the most notable skeptics of the 18th century is a good illustration of just how convincing and conclusive is this evidence. These two men, Gilbert West and Lord Littleton, ranked among the most brilliant intellectuals of their day. After many clever sallies against biblical Christianity, they decided that if two great fundamentals of the gospel were overthrown, Christianity would crumble into ruin. They decided to take that on. These fundamentals were the resurrection of Christ and the conversion of St. Paul. So West undertook to write a treatise on the resurrection, proving it to be a fabrication, just made up. And Littleton vowed to produce a treatise demonstrating that St. Paul was not miraculously converted on the Damascus Road. They therefore started to sift the evidence which they believed was pure fabrication and which they were determined to expose and explode. From time to time they met in conference and then one day West said to Littleton, quote, I have something very important to relate. You know, little one, how keen I was to expose, as pure fabrication, the resurrection of Christ. I therefore determined to thoroughly sift the evidence, and in doing so, I had to be honest, I had to be sincere, I had to be honorable, and I had to forsake my prejudice and act on strict legal principle. Having pursued this line, I have been forced to the conclusion that Jesus Christ really rose from the dead. Now, you may laugh at me if you like, Littleton, but I got down on my knees and asked the risen Savior to save me, <coughs> and he has done it. Fearing the worst from his old friend, Littleton replied, strange to relate, I have had a similar experience. I, too, sifted the evidence sincerely, candidly, and honestly. And the more I weighed the evidence, the more I was forced to the conclusion that St. Paul was really remarkably converted on the Damascus Road. That being so, West, as an honest person, I could do no other but fall on my knees and ask the same Christ to save me, and he has done it. Dr. Paisley continues, in the course of time, the treatises of West and Littleton appeared. West's treatise vindicated the resurrection, Littleton's the conversion of St. Paul. Both these treatises can be found in our libraries today. To them, unbelief has never been able to fabricate an answer. He says here, to these arguments, how they showed the evidence convinced them, the liberals who can't really study it, they haven't been able to give a, a rebuke. Uh, Anne Rice, who wrote uh, Interview with a Vampire, was a Roman Catholic and got convinced in her liberal college years to, uh, to say that you know, all of her Christianity, all of her Christian beliefs were just mythology. She, for some reason, went back to study it, and she was shocked to realize that what she had been taught was foolishness and that the, <laughs> the simplest... Uh, research, as she would, had done for her books, the simplest research would show that the arguments against them were meaningless. So she became a Roman Catholic back again and uh, wrote a different book, including the Son of God in it. But those treatises, they stand as monuments to the fact that if the evidence for the resurrection of Christ is sifted and weighed honestly, it will be found to be convincing and conclusive. The titles of these are The Observations on the History and Evidence of the Resurrection of Jesus Christ, published in 1747, and then Observations on the Conversion and Apostleship of St. Paul in a Letter to Gilbert West, Esquire. So, uh, this has been true... Um, recent times. Josh McDowell was a great scholar 
and he decided to once and for all seek it out, disprove the resurrection of Christ. At the end of that time, he bowed and accepted Christ as Savior and wrote some wonderful books on evidence that demands a verdict. <laughs> and you can find those in your Christian bookstore. Uh, as he goes through, finds out what he found out, that it's true, historically true. We then, as Christians, may not be the great scholars. We may not be the, the well-read people of history and understand how legally to weigh the evidence, but we have the evidence of those who were those great scholars. And they said, I had to admit the truth. Let's bow for prayer. Father, our gathering today is more than to bolster the legends. It is more than to uh, stir us up to renew our faith in the unbelievable. The world has just not seriously considered the evidence. We ask, Father, that you might help us then, perhaps by faith, perhaps by faith added, aided by research, to recognize that there is no argument to eliminate the fact that Christ rose from the dead. And if that be true, then there is a God. If that be true, then there is Christ the Savior. If it is true, then our hope of salvation is in no one else but Christ. For no leader of religion has promised to rise from the dead and fulfilled that promise. I ask that you might touch our hearts then with the reality that what we believe is in actual fact truth. It is not just our religious belief, but it is a religious belief in truth. With heads bowed and eyes closed, it may be saying, Pastor, I never really have accepted Christ as my Savior. I like the Christian life. I like the Christian people but I haven't received Christ as my Savior. May I say to you, if you put it off, you're playing with eternal life. For Christ may call you to the judgment today. And if so, your time is up. It may be that God will give you a long life, but at the end, you will die and face eternity because it is appointed unto man once to do it, die, and after this, the judgment. Let me ask you, like Gilbert and West, to come to the place where you think about this. And if it is true, then it calls for a verdict from you, for you to say, yes, I believe it's true, and I need God's salvation. If that's your prayer, I wonder if you'd slip your hand up and say, pray for, with me about that. Pray for me that I can take it into my heart and understand it and receive Christ as my Savior and my Master. Pray for me. Father, then we close with this thought that you have given your life for us and died in our place that if we receive it, then we will not perish but have everlasting life. I thank you for those who are willing in this day to take a stand for that and to say to others, if you're looking for purpose in life, you can find it in Christ. And so we commit these things in your name. Amen.